The Reverend Jim Jones was one of the most bizarre religious leaders America has ever known. On November 18, 1978, he ordered his followers to commit suicide. Why did over 900 people follow one man to their doom? How did Jim Jones control so many lives? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. I want you to be like I am. I want you to become what I am. I want you to enjoy the fearlessness that I have, the courage that I have, the compassion that I have, the love that I have, the all-encompassing mercy that I am. I want you to be what I am and something greater. And if you don't want to go this route, then go to hell where you want to, but don't bother me. The Reverend Jim Jones, born 1931, died November 18th, 1978, with 913 of his followers in the jungle settlement of Jonestown, Guyana. How did it happen? What was the basis of Jim Jones' frightening power over his followers? If his story is told again, will it serve as a lesson for now? James Warren Jones came from a poor southern Indiana family. Jimmy was a serious-minded but rebellious boy who became captivated by fundamentalist Christianity. In what was then a stronghold of the Ku Klux Klan, the young Jones preached racial integration and utopian socialism. To finance his first interracial church, he sold live monkeys door to door. In 1965, Jones moved his congregation to Redwood Valley, California. Haunted by visions of nuclear apocalypse, he declared that here at last was a safe place to build his utopian community, the People's yeah, Temple. Level of society, all socioeconomic income straight from professional down to the ordinary field worker, field labor, mill worker. Uh, really, it's beautiful to see that all these divisions have been broken down, not only race, but any differences of economic position. But just a warm fellowship and acceptance of all people. We started with about 141 people, and from that we've grown to a very thriving congregation of a few thousand. Chris, I didn't think you'd be tired. Not around you. Jones achieved extraordinary rapport with people, especially with the aged and with blacks. Thank you for inviting me in. To those who felt useless and unwanted, he offered respect and love. Jim Jones was a fiery minister who ridiculed the Christian deity as an impotent sky god. Grace Stone was a top aide to Jim Jones. Uh, Jim Jones wasn't a Christian. Um, he was an atheist, and Jim used to have people uh, bring the Bibles into the church, and he would throw them down, he would stomp on them, he would spit on them, and he would talk about using the pages for toilet paper. Oh, Debbie okay. Layton was a member of the Temple Planning Commission. Uh, Jim Jones was a brilliant man, clever, deceitful and evil, but he was very, very clever, and he read all the books on sociology and psychology and other cults and brainwashing, and he knew exactly what to say and what to do to impress and influence other people. Jones was a gifted showman, an expert practitioner of faith healing. According to numerous reports, most of the healings were phony, but they appealed especially to fundamentalist worshippers who had a long tradition of theatrics and high emotion in their religion. 
I think that Jones was able to attract a lot of people into the church because he got to these people at a point in their life where they were vulnerable, um, be it with they were in the middle of a divorce or they were depressed or they were lonely. Um, I was a very, very rebellious kid, and Jim used guilt to bring me into the church and keep me there. He said people from affluent backgrounds uh, that, are, that are spoiled cannot stay in a group like this, cannot stay in a structured life and give of themselves to other people. And I was determined that I cared about other people and I was going to stay in people's temple. Walk with me. Walk with you had an instant family. You had instant friends. You never had to be alone. If you had any problems, you always had someone to go to. You were just never alone. You always had support, and that's very powerful. Charles Gary was People's Temple attorney for two years. Jim Jones had tremendous charisma. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever met anybody with more charisma. He was very fascinating, very enthusiastic in what he had to say, and very convincing. It's only when you begin to read between the lines as you knew him over a period of time that you began to get the feeling that he had a tremendous ego, and that ego was almost destructive. As Temple membership soared, Jones became increasingly political. He mobilized thousands to help elect the late San Francisco mayor, George Moscone, who rewarded him with the prestigious directorship of the Housing Authority. Jim Jones was highly respected in San Francisco. He supported Ronald Reagan as governor and Richard Nixon. He was a tremendous champion of free speech, civil rights, civil liberties, anything that was progressive and good. Along with Jones' increasing power came fear of media persecution. On one occasion, he gave permission to film services in Los Angeles but suddenly reneged on his promise. I really don't feel comfortable with our worship being photographed. I really don't. I must go against the entire council. I don't feel good about it. They can photograph me all they choose, because I do not care. I'm fearless. But I don't want the cameras focusing on others. I don't want them. Ask me your questions, and I'll tell you right straight from the shoulder where I stand. You want to get out there? Okay. What was passing between this man and his congregation? It was perhaps a form of romance, but as time went on, Jones seemed to change. The dark side of his personality came to the fore. Every single member of your family had to get on the floor and say something negative about you. And that was to break down any ties and unity within a family so that when you did come to the realization that something was wrong and you wanted to leave, you could not feel the bond to go to a family member and say, listen, something's wrong here, let's get out. To this, um, Tommy Bogue was seven years old when his parents brought him to People's Temple. They had these little kids, maybe six, seven years old, go into this room and then make them grab hold of these, these electrode things and they start turning up the electricity on them and they'd put a microphone next to the door and you start hearing them screaming, you know, I mean, it sounds, I mean, it's bloody chilling, it's the only way I can really put it. After critical articles appeared in the San Francisco Examiner, Jones staged the demonstration. All of these allegations are totally untrue. I'm principled and dedicated to my people, and they are also committed to the Christian ethic, the Judeo-Christian ethic of service. Certainly anyone who wants to investigate our organization, we're more than open to it by any honestly inquiring group or otherwise. So intimidating was Jones' demonstration that the newspaper canceled its series of articles on People's Temple. I think that Jones probably was an unhappy person. Deep down inside, he didn't believe in himself. And so he was constantly having to attain more money to be more secure, more political friends. Jones would freak out when anybody would speak against the church or him. Jim hated men. He was very insecure. And only women became the top uh, aides to him. According to Debbie Layton in the book In My Father's House, Jones appropriated her brother Larry's first wife, Carolyn. When Larry remarried, Jones also seduced his second wife, Karen. Ex-Temple member Richard Clark. 
I think that uh, Jones was burning up with lust. Matter of fact, he finally told him one night, he finally said that he would like to have sex with everybody in the, in the temple, you know. Every single woman that was on the planning commission was approached by Jim Jones and forced into a sexual relationship. And I consider it rape. I was raped by Jim Jones. In late 1977, New West Magazine printed a blistering expose of People's Temple. Grace Stone sued for custody of her six-year-old son, who Jones claimed was his child. Jones reacted to his difficulties by moving Temple members 6,000 miles to Jonestown, a settlement he had started earlier in Guyana. Here, Jones would have to answer to no man. Jonestown would be a world unto itself. Flour, flour, rice, black-eyed peas, more peas. You have different containers around the place. We couldn't go through all the tremendous inventory they built up. Kool-Aid. What a swing! What liberation brings! The first time I went there in October of 1977, I came back and I said I saw a paradise. They had their own electricity, they had their own generators, they had the most perfect medical setup I have ever seen. Everything was immaculate, everything was good, and everything was decent. When fascist terror brings concentration camps or brings massive food riots, you have a home. You, you just can't imagine that all the uh, hundreds of us here are so extremely happy. I wish I could describe the whole thing to you, but it's hard. But I just must say this. I can't help but say that none of this would have been possible had it not been for Jim Jones. I thank you, Jim. You have certainly made a way for us. And everybody seemed to be so happy. I am pleased. Thank you, Jim. I don't want to go back to the States. Because this place is better. That was pretty much an ideal situation, because like, you could see progress happening. You know, you, you had a, a sense of, of you're, you're creating a town. But then when Jones came down there, that all changed. They started having the long meetings until 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. They started having 12-hour work days. And the discipline started getting into the extremes. And, I mean, it just became the hellhole. When I got to Jonestown, the first thing Jones asked me was, how did I want to die? And uh, he asked me, did I want to die uh, fighting? Uh, did I want to take the portion? Then I knew what I was up against then. It was death that Jones had chosen for us. As more people packed into Jonestown, food supplies ran low. Jones controlled millions in temple funds, but refused to spend it on food or adequate housing. Isolated in the jungle, news from outside came to him in radioed fragments. His fears and suspicions multiplied. Quite likely I'll be there for both. For 900 people, life became an answer to one man's whim. Jonestown was their entire reality. Jim Jones was their god. I woke up and I had um, a constriction, I guess, in my chest or in my stomach, and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe at all. And I didn't even call on Father. I thought of him, and it all was like... Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Around John was just like a force field of evil. It would even take your mind, just like you couldn't even think when you was around John, because it's the force that he had built up. The most frightening things about Jonestown were that there were armed guards surrounding the camp at all times, and while you worked in the field, they watched you, and you weren't allowed to speak to your neighbor, and you had to work double time. And Jim Jones's voice went over the loudspeakers 24 hours a day while you ate, while you worked in the field, and while you slept. When Grace Stone carried her custody battle for her son John John into Guyanese courts, Jones was beside himself. If by any chance you would make a mistake to try to come in and take any one of us, 
We will not let you. You will die. You will have to take anybody over all of our dead bodies. Jim Jones was not sane. He had not been sane since I saw him in August of 1978. His paranoia was destructive. I warned him about his paranoia, but he treated that as though I was an enemy. I got a hell of a lot of weapons to fight. I got my claws, I got guns, I got dynamite, I got a hell of a lot to fight. I'll fight, I'll fight, I'll fight. By mid-November 1978, concerned relatives of Temple members persuaded Congressman Leo Ryan to visit Jonestown. Ryan brought reporters and a network news team. Nothing could have triggered more dread in Jim Jones. At first, the visit was a success for Jones. Ryan and reporters saw only the superficial, positive side of Jonestown. The next morning, however, Ten people, including Richard Clark, fled into the jungle. Several other families told the Ryan party they wanted to leave. Jones could not change their minds. Congressman Ryan came over to him and he said, Jim, don't be upset about this. He said, if half of the people here were to leave, I would still say you have the most beautiful place. It's a dream. Jones would not be soothed. Is it conceivable that he was mentally unstable from an early age? A borderline psychotic who attempted to realize his paranoid delusions of grandeur? Now his dreams seem to crumble around him. People play games, friend. They lie, they lie. What can I do about liars? Are you people going to leave us? I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. Anybody wants to get out of here can get out of here. We have no problem about getting out here. They come and go all the time. I don't know what kind of game. People like, who, who, people like publicity. Some people do. I don't. Emotions ran high as the defectors left with the Ryan party. Tommy Bogue was among them. So we're going down the road, and then they stop to take some pictures further along. When they stop, we tell them, don't stop. Keep going, because something's going to happen. So we come into the airport, and that's where we all get off and we wait for the airplane. And I loaded onto the big airplane, but I was sitting right across from the door in the back. Okay, and then that's when we saw the tractor and trailer coming around. When the shooting stopped, Congressman Ryan, three newsmen, and young Patty Parks lay dead. Ten others, including Tommy Bogue, were wounded. Odell Rhodes is one of the few surviving eyewitnesses to what happened next in Jonestown. Jim Jones came over the speaker system himself, and he called everyone to a general meeting. It's too late. The Congress is dead. The Congress today's dead. Many of our traitors are dead. They're all laying out their dead. He told us that the Guyanese army would parachute in on us and... Uh, they would torture older people and babies and that, you know, when they come, you know, we should all be dead. If we can't live in peace, then let's die in peace. We've been so betrayed. We've been so terribly betrayed. And uh, I was just looking, I mean, here are people my age, uh, older people, younger people, and they were, for the most part, they were voluntarily taking at the time. They were voluntarily drinking poison. This is a revolutionary suicide. This is not a self-destructive suicide. Please, for God's sake, let's get on with it. We've lived, we've lived as no other people have lived and loved. We've had as much of this world as you're going to get. Let's just be done with it. Let's be done with the agony of it. Eyewitness Stanley Clayton. Some people was not getting up out of their seat. They were sitting there, you know, um, scareless, you know, the deaf, you know, don't want, they don't want to do this, where people with the, the with Jim Jones there, you know, uh, imposing himself on these people, uh, pulling people out of the chair, you know, and saying, 
it's time, you know, we do not want, you know, the GDF to come in here and castrate us. Or we do not want them to come in and shoot us down like dogs, you know. Let's die with dignity and so forth. In fact, that people listened to that, but then there were some that didn't listen to that, and those who did not listen to that were forcibly pulled up out of their seats. If they didn't go over there, they were injected right there. Hurry, my children, hurry. They does not fall in the hands of the enemy. Hurry, my children. Quickly, 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 quickly. Odell Rhodes and Stanley Clayton escaped into the jungle. When Odell returned with Guyanese officials, they found Jim Jones shot in the head. Of 914 dead, only he and his nurse had not taken poison. Jim Jones and most of his followers are gone. But disturbing questions remain. Is our present society especially vulnerable to men like Jones? Are there other cults in America with tragic potential? Reportedly, there are still people who venerate Jim Jones, who sleep with his picture, and who feel he is the only person who ever loved them. Organizations that offer solutions to all of life's problems can be seductive, but also perilous. Might the lesson of Jonestown help people avoid the danger? The church was bizarre at the end, but it didn't start out that way. What a person saw the church in the beginning and what they saw afterwards were two different things. People were tricked, and I believe that most people can be tricked. <laughs>